What happens when God warns? We're going to be talking about Solomon today. Now, for the past couple of months, I started noticing a common message now that kept coming up in the scriptures that I was reading. And the Lord began to show me something that I think can be very beneficial to every one of us. Now, when David's son Solomon first took the throne, he felt inadequate for the task. He really, he, he felt very uh, inhibited. So he asked God for wisdom. And in 1 Kings 3 verse 10, it was very pleasing to God that he asked for that. But God gave him a warning in verse 14. And God told Solomon, if you walk in my ways, keeping my statues and my commandments as your father David walked, then I'm going to prolong your days. Now, I didn't think much about that warning. It seemed like maybe any condition that would be added to somebody's prophecy. But as I studied the life of Solomon, I began to realize that God was warning Solomon over and over uh, through a lot of different ways that he was not to have anything to do with foreign women. He was trying to warn him not to worship foreign gods, and he was trying to get him to obey him only. And I still didn't think that much about the warning until God began to impress me with something very interesting. Now, I want you to follow with me because I think this is very important. God had made some promises to David, Solomon's father, throughout David's life. But the same conditions now or the same warnings were not included in the promises to David. And he was never warned against following after other gods. Have you ever wondered why Solomon had that warning, but David didn't? Well, the answer is very simple. There was no need to warn David because David's heart was wholly obedient to God. It wasn't lip service with him. He was a man after God's own heart, and God knew he knew his heart. And so he didn't need to warn David because it wasn't a problem with David. But God knew that it was going to be a problem with Solomon. So God was forewarning Solomon uh, of this weakness that he knew was going to be a real big downfall if it was not eliminated. And yet, in spite of all the warnings, Solomon somehow missed it and he failed now to heed the warning. And so in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 10, now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughters of Pharaoh, Boabite women, Amorite, Edomite, Sidonian women, and Hittite women from the nation which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, neither shall they associate with you. For they will surely turn your heart away after them. But Solomon held fast to them in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives did turn his heart away. For it came about when Solomon was old, that his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after the goddess of the Sidonians and after the detestable idol of the Amorites. And Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as his father David had done. Then Solomon built a high place for the detestable idol of Moab and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him that he should not go after other gods. But he did not listen to the Lord. Well, this is such a sad ending uh, for someone who had been given so much, but God had tried to prevent this. Okay, where am I headed with all this? Well, the objective of this Bible study now, the message that I believe God's trying to get us to hear, is that He was wanting us to begin to notice the patterns to the warnings now that we've each been given through the years. Now, the warnings we've gotten may not seem as significant as the warning not to follow after other gods. We probably haven't gotten that warning. But whatever the warning is, it is sent to prevent some degree now of destruction. And that's what he was trying to do for Solomon. Now, three things that we need to pay attention to. Number one, God wants us to notice the warnings. Sometimes the warnings will come through scripture. Sometimes it'll come through a sermon. Sometimes it'll just come through a person that's talking to us. And he wants, number two, then for us to begin to notice the constructive criticism that often comes our way. Sometimes we're given constructive criticism and we need to pay attention to it. And then number three, he wants us to begin to notice the conditions 
that are included in the prophecies that we received, no matter how subtle the conditions might be. Sometimes we get a prophecy and the conditions, you know, we have to really look to hear them, but they're important. And God wants us to realize that all these various warnings were sent now to prevent our stumbling. That's what they're for. Now, we are no more exempt from the warnings than Solomon was 3,000 years ago. Now, Solomon's great grace period finally ended and disaster came. Now, the bad seeds that had been sown, they were continually watered until they finally brought in the harvest. Now, God didn't send the disaster. He wanted Solomon, and he wanted Solomon's descendants now uh, to have the kingdom. And he was speaking for Solomon and not against him. He, he was doing everything he knew to do, not to violate Solomon's will, but to get Solomon to hear him. And that's why he warned. But Solomon was not going to listen. And finally, during the reign of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, he lost 10 of the tribes. You know, it's sad to think that Solomon had this huge kingdom. And then one son later, he loses 10 of the tribes to Jeroboam because of just foolishness and disobedience. And instead then of inheriting Solomon's wisdom, that wisdom then became corrupted through sin, just as Lucifer did in Ezekiel 28. Lucifer was so wise, but as soon as he quit following God, he lost all of his wisdom. And when you read the life of Rehoboam, instead of governing the kingdom now with wisdom and discernment, we find that he shows extreme foolishness and total lack of wisdom. And it's sad when you think about it that Solomon's wisdom had been perverted by the time it was passed on to the next generation. He had been the wisest man in the world, and here one generation later, his son has no wisdom. And we think, well, how could he have been that foolish? How could he have done that? But the question is, how smart are we? And I want us to look now for just a few minutes at the pattern now to the warnings that Solomon got. And I want us to see if we've had some of the same patterns of warning. That's what we need to look for. So in Proverbs 1, we find God trying to warn Solomon from early childhood. And in the first six chapters of Proverbs now, Solomon is talking about the instructions now that he's received from his father and mother. And so he remembers them. He's, he's quoting the back. In Proverbs 1, 8, and 9, it's a really good example. He quotes that, Hear my son, your father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teachings. So he's saying, I got many instructions, many teachings from my mother and father. And then uh, he says, indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head. Okay, that means it was uh, those instructions were like a crown there, right over his brain that he could have listened to at any time. Now Solomon was saying, these are the things that were told to me by my parents. So he knows it. He's quoting them back. And interestingly enough, chapters 1 through 5 are a warning against seduction and lust when you look into them. Now that's a little unusual, but you can see that God was trying so hard now to remind him of the instructions that he had received from his father and his mother in childhood. So God was trying very hard now uh, to get his attention, and he was trying to do it very early on. The, these instructions came when he was just a child. Now, when God tells children in the Word to obey their parents, you know, that could stop some lifelong failures if children would just listen, you know, before they even have a chance to take root, because that's what God intends, is for us to listen to our parents. Okay, now, what our parents harped on the most in our behavior was probably something that we needed to hear the most. Now, did you know that it's, a, it's probable uh, to hear warnings so often that we just don't hear them? Uh, if they've been said to us over and over, sometimes we don't hear them. Okay, I think you probably know what I mean. You probably remember that your parents maybe said some things to you often, and finally you just you kind of tucked them back until you didn't remember them. And you can subconsciously now condition your mind not to hear it's even possible to mouth back those childhood uh, sayings that our parents have given us without processing them, without putting them to use. Now, evidently, Solomon did that. He wrote Proverbs 1 through 5 saying, pay attention to the advice of your parents. He's the one that wrote that. Pay attention to the advice of God. Yet all the while that he was mouthing all that good advice, he was not paying attention to the words that God had specifically spoken to him. And he was marrying outside the faith, and he was doing it right and left. Okay, now does any of this fit? 
Is there a certain area where we specifically remember being warned, uh, maybe throughout our childhood? At the time, it might not have seemed like a very big deal, because I'm sure when we hear things from our parents as we're growing up, you know, we just kind of lay them aside. They don't sound like that big a deal. Uh, but don't be too sure. If you were constantly warned in a certain area, it's because someone saw a weakness and God was trying to prevent a fall. Now, I remember a particular classmate, and he had a very annoying quirk. And a lot of the kids just teased him and harassed him about it. But he did have a few friends who sincerely tried to talk to him about it because they saw it too. But instead of listening, he took it as rejection. He took it that they didn't like him and they were putting him down. Now, those warnings, no matter how they come, they could have been the greatest blessings in the world to him if he had just heeded, if he had just listened to them. It, it would have saved a lot of heartache. And I remember... Uh, Overhearing a lady, she was talking to a teenage girl who was visiting in her home. And very kindly, the white lady was warning the girl about the consequences of unbecoming behavior with, with guys. And uh, it was obvious that the girl was not listening. She, you, know, you could tell by the look on her face she wasn't listening. Now, the lady was handling the situation with a lot of love and a lot of finesse. But I could tell that this teenage girl was completely turned off by the whole conversation. And it was obvious that she was rejecting the warning that she was being given. So I, now, who knows how many times that same warning had come to her, you know, from maybe different sources. And who knows also what the results were going to be from her failure to listen. But the warning did come, nevertheless. And I totally believe that many times things where we fall later on, if we would think back, God was giving us warnings through different people. Now, for just a moment, I want you to think back uh, to a particular thing that was said to you over and over through childhood by different parents, different people, maybe parents, teachers, whoever. And then I want you to ask yourself, was it an area that I just never dealt with? I heard it and I didn't think that much about it, but I just didn't deal with it. Now, if you didn't, you're probably going to find out that you're still putting up with it in one way or another, and it's stealing from you. And that's why God was trying to get your attention. Maybe you never finished projects and, and you would start things and never finished. And maybe your parents nagged you and you just didn't pay any attention. Maybe you weren't wise in your spending habits and you had various warnings from different people. Maybe you never picked up the, your mess. Maybe you never cleaned your room and your parents probably nagged a lot and they didn't like the clutter. But now the clutter is stealing your time and your peace and your credibility. Maybe you covered up and told lies to your parents. Maybe you didn't obey your parents and teachers, and now obedience to God now is really hard. It's not too late to change. In fact, God is commanding it. That's what he's telling us we must do. But how much easier it would have been if we had heeded those warnings early on. Okay, let's go now on with the pattern of Solomon's warnings through childhood. The second warning that we have recorded was when David had Solomon crowned king. And in 2 Kings 2, 1 through 4, as David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. So be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God. And keep the charge when he tells you to walk in his ways, to keep his statues, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies. So David's telling him exactly what he needs to do. And he said, do this according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promises, which he spoke, saying, if your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all of their heart, with all of their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne uh, of, of your kingdom. I mean, that was a pretty beautiful promise to him. Now, this warning had double significance. Not only is it now his father's last significant words, but it's also the first warning that was issued to him as the new monarch of the kingdom. And so it had a double whammy. Now, most people are more prone to hear the dying words of a person, especially someone as significant as David was. You're also more prone to hear the words of advice when you've just taken over a position and you feel a little inadequate and maybe unsure of yourself. 
Well, Solomon felt all those things. It was the last significant words of his father, David, and he was feeling very inadequate. He had a lot of self-doubt when he first went into the kingdom because he was pretty young. And he was a prime candidate now of hearing good advice, and yet he didn't. He had good advice coming to him constantly. Okay, what advice did David give him? In 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, he said, Be strong and show yourself to be a man. Okay, now maybe David's son had a little immaturity already at work. And David may have been seeing that, you know. And so he said, be strong, show yourself to be a man. Uh, be grown up, you know. In other words, David was saying, take the leadership, be strong in what you know is right, do what's right, and don't be swayed. And in this case, of course, it was going to be the wives that swayed him. And verse 3, he said, obey God. And what will the results of, of this be? Success in all you do. He said, if you'll just do these things, you're going to be successful in everything you do. Uh, number one, be a success. Number two, God will carry out his promise. And number three, not a man will be lacking on your throne. Okay, that's pretty significant. Now, this is the second recorded warning. And we don't know how many times it came to him. You know, it's recorded in the Word, but there's no telling how many times it had been said. And the common thread is, Solomon, just obey God. That's, that was the common thread. Now, can you think back to times of uncertainty in your life? It may have been maybe at the time of a death, or, or maybe when you were starting a new endeavor. It might not be as dramatic as becoming a king, you know, but when we encounter any new beginning in our life, this is usually a time when we t tend to do a lot of soul searching, and that's what we should be doing. And that's usually a time when God does bring to our attention areas where we need to make changes. And those areas are not brought without purpose. When God starts showing us something, we better listen because there's a reason for it. And uh, they are brought so that we will change before it's too late. Now, the third recorded warning from God came to Solomon at approximately the same time as the warning that came from his father, David. You know, so, I mean, he's hearing it from different directions. Now, the kingdom had fallen into his lap, and Solomon really was feeling the pressure. At first, he was feeling so insecure, and he was feeling the magnitude now of the responsibility. And these warnings now, they're not brought without purpose. You know, it's so we'll change. That's the whole reason why God's bringing them to us. And the third recorded warning from God now came to Solomon at approximately the same time as the warning that was coming from David. Now, the kingdom had fallen into his lap. And Solomon was feeling the pressure of the magnitude of that responsibility. Now, his father had given him all the advice needed for him to be successful. I mean, he wanted him to be successful, and, and he, may, he may, have saw, may have seen some uh, problems, and so I, he, he probably was saying it pretty often. Maybe Solomon got tired of listening. Who knows what was happening? But God goes a step further, and God himself then appears and warns him personally in a dream. Wow, God must have really wanted him to hear it for him to, to do this. And in 1 Kings 3, 5 in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, ask what you want me to do for you. What do you want me to do? And verse 14, and if you walk in my ways and you keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. And we think, wow, if God spoke to him personally in a dream, you know, how on earth would he have missed that? Well, I'm going to show you some reasons why Solomon could pass over the advice. And it's also <clears throat> the same reason now that keeps us from hearing at times. So I want you to take note of this. One reason that we miss it, Solomon convinced himself that everything was fine. Okay, how did he convince himself that way? Well, in 1 Kings 4, 29 through 35, now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind like the sands of the seashore. Whoa, you know, we don't know anyone else in the Word of God that had this kind of wisdom. And Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, and his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs. 
and he wrote a thousand five songs. You know, if they were just kind of making this up, they would have said he he wrote a lot of songs or he wrote many songs. But no, they give us the exact number. He wrote a thousand five songs. He spoke of trees from the cedars that that were in Lebanon even to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke also of animals and birds and creeping things and and fish. I mean, he knew uh, something about everything. And men came from all the kingdoms of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Can't you imagine? They, They just came to sit and just listen to him. Solomon had everything going for him. He was blessed by God probably as much as any man who was alive. So I can see where it would have been easy for Solomon to think, You know, surely I must be doing everything right. You know, look how God has blessed me. We have a tendency to think that way. If we're being blessed, wow, I must be doing things pretty well. When we're being blessed, we feel like everything is okay. We've all done that. Now, if we went home tonight and we found a huge unexpected check in our mailbox, we'd be jumping up and down and we'd be feeling so blessed. And this wouldn't be a time now when we would be recalling past warnings, you know. Uh, We wouldn't be thinking about things we had done wrong. This is when we'd be thinking, whoa, I must be doing everything right. Even my little dog, when I'd throw a a big bone with meat on it out to him, uh, I guarantee you he wasn't remembering that the day before I had warned her not to chew up the garden hose. She wasn't thinking about that. She was thinking about that bone I'd just given her. And so she was enjoying this blessing. Well, Solomon was enjoying his blessing. He wasn't thinking about past warnings. Okay, but do you know what? All the tremendous warnings and all the discernment and all the riches did not protect him from destruction that came because of this one area of weakness. He he failed to listen to the warnings. We can see where maybe he could pass over them and not think that much about them, but he's still going to be in trouble, and that's why God kept warning him. And uh, he still fell to be obedient. But because we have a lot going for us in one area, doesn't mean that it's going to be okay in all areas. Okay, now let's look at another reason why it was easy for Solomon to overlook the warnings. Solomon builds the temple, and then he prays the famous dedication prayer, 1 Kings chapter 8, and he's exalting God. And he ends with verses 59 and 62. And may these words of mine with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel, as each day requires, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, therefore there is no one else. Okay, now, and then he goes on to say, let your heart therefore be wholly devoted to the Lord. So he's telling his people, your heart's got to be wholly devoted to the Lord. And you must do that to keep his commandments as at this day. And the king and all of Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. Okay, I mean, he's saying, he's telling his people, love God, obey God, do what you're supposed to be doing. And he was very exact about it. So he's saying all the right things. He's even telling the people to do all the things that God's told you to do. He said, don't forget any of them. And so he's sounding so right even to himself. He's probably patting himself on the back thinking, I'm giving these people such good advice, you know. And that's where the deception then comes in. Because we we can see all the right things many times until we fool ourselves. We've all got some right things going. And it's very easy to look at those right things and just kind of close our eyes to things that we're not doing right. And this is the time when God appeared to him with a fourth warning. So God's really trying to get his attention. And God doesn't say, practice what you preach. No, he's not saying that. He simply issues the same warning one more time. And so in 1 Kings 9, 2 through 7, the Lord appears to Solomon again, just as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayers, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house, which you've built, by putting my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there. And he said, they'll be there perpetually. And as far as from you, so God's saying it again, if you will walk before me as your father David walked in integrity and uprightness, doing according to all that I've commanded, you will keep, if you'll keep my uh, statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. 
So he's, he's giving it to him. He's, he's telling him exactly what he needs to hear. And he said, I will do this just as I promised to your father David, saying, you shall not lack a man on this throne uh, of Israel. But if you and your sons shall indeed turn uh, away from following me and shall not keep my commandments, which I have commanded, uh, and if you go out to serve other gods and worship them, he said, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and the house which I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight so Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all people. You know, he didn't just tell him all the good things he was going to do, but he, he told him what I'll do if you don't do this. So he saw both sides. And we think, why couldn't he have seen this? Why couldn't he have heard this? And sadly, all of that happened. Then in verse four, God was basically saying, I've done what you ask. Now let's talk about you. That's basically what he was saying. And we think, how could Solomon have been that blind? You know, after God appeared to him twice, you know, how on earth did he miss that? Now, the reason is I, it's really easy to overlook. Instead of listening to the warning, instead of paying attention now to the message that's being said, Solomon was preoccupied over here with all the area where he was being obedient. He had some areas where he was being very obedient. Uh, he had just finished building the temple. That was no easy task. That probably took more energy and thought and, uh, than anyone else would have had. And so Solomon was totally obedient in that area. And I'm sure he was thinking, I know God has to be so pleased with me. Look, look at this unbelievable uh, temple that I've built for him. And I can see where it would have been easy to pat himself on the back and, uh, and think about all the great jobs that he was doing because God had chosen him over his father. And I'm sure he thought about that. You know, my, my father wanted to build this, but God didn't let him build it. He gave that job to me. You, you can almost hear his thoughts. And it took unbelievable time, effort, and obedience to build this temple. God's bound to see how hard I've worked. Okay, this was a definite area of obedience, and he felt very proud of himself. But it didn't cover up the lack of obedience now in the areas where God had been warning him over and over and over. And I thought, how many times do we find ourselves ignoring God in one area by concentrating over on an area where, uh, where we are being obedient? We get into some pride of, over that, and it keeps us from seeing the areas where we're not doing as well. And because all of us have some areas of uh, obedience. All of us have that. And it's easy to look at that and just kind of close our eyes to what we're not doing right. So I can see where Solomon could have fallen for this. Now, it would have been easy to concentrate on this magnificent task of building the temple. He probably knew that no one else could have done it. And God knew that. That's why God told David, don't do it. I'm giving this job to, to Solomon. And so I'm sure he was feeling very important at having been chosen by God. And I'm sure he got very preoccupied uh, <clears throat> with that. And so it was easy to let the other things slide. But the results finally came and the grace period ended. Now, right before I went to Israel the first time, we were teaching a lot of seminars. We were teaching Bible studies every week. We were working with people one-on-one -on -one practically every day. So we were burning the candle at both ends. And everything was great, and I, I felt like everything was fine. I, I felt good at what all we were being able to accomplish. But no sooner had I gotten on that plane with nothing to do for many hours while we were flying halfway around the world, the Lord pulled my attention back to something that He had told me to do. See, as long as I was busy, as long as I was being obedient in other things, you know, he, it kept me distracted. And I had my eyes on areas now where I was doing it right, and God had to take me away from all that, had to get my attention again, because it was an area that would have brought a, a degree of, of destruction. So notice the pattern to the warnings of Solomon. He was warned through childhood. He was warned with a loved one at the end of that loved one's life. He was warned at a time of fear and uncertainty when he first took the throne. He was warned at a time when he was vulnerable, when he was seeking God because he felt inadequate for the task that he was about to do. He was warned after completing a huge job, job the temple. And so notice the pattern. God was warning him at every opportunity when he would most likely have been able to have heard. 
because God loved him. God wanted him to hear, and God is still doing the same thing for us today. Now, this Bible study can be one of the most beneficial messages that we'll ever hear if we'll determine in our heart to just let it be that. If we'll determine in our heart to say, okay, I, I do see the things where I've done it right and I know God's pleased, but Lord, I want to see every area where you want me to change. We've got to be that open with the Lord. We're not warned against something that will never be a temptation to us. David was not warned in these areas, and it was simply because God knew that it was not a weakness with David. Now, it's highly improbable that you're going to be warned in an area that's not a problem to you. Uh, it'll help if you remember that because you're going to know when you're warned that you'd better listen. It's time to listen. It's highly improbable that the healthy eater is going to be warned over and over about putting junk food in his body. That's probably not something that God's going to warn him about. It's highly improbable that the child who demonstrates excellent manners and respect will be warned over and over about a rebellious tongue. That probably won't happen. It's highly improbable that the wife who is wholly devoted to her husband, physically and emotionally, will continually be given warnings against adultery. That's more than likely it's never going to happen. Now, so notice the warnings that you get. The only reason Solomon was warned over and over in a certain area was because that was his weakness. So you don't have to worry about the areas where you're not being uh, talked to. Think about the areas where you are being warned. And that's why it's worth our time to meditate the scriptures and hear the warnings that seem to come up over and over and over. It's worth our time to meditate the condition uh, to our prophecies. It's worth, really, our time to meditate the advice that we receive even from our family and friends. You know, it doesn't always have to be coming from God. Sometimes God's using another mouth. And it could be the most valuable time that we'll ever spend listening to something that God is saying through another person. Now, we've, we're no more exempt from these warnings than Solomon was 3,000 years ago. Now, most of the time, we keep a notebook of prophecies that we've received through the years, and we can usually readily recall those promises. And many times we're putting God in remembrance of those promises, and we should. God tells us to do that. But try something else. Get a notebook and go back through the prophecies and copy down just the conditions. Just pull the conditions out of those prophecies, especially take note of the conditions that show up more than once. And also make an entry in the notebook of constructive criticisms that you get from people that you know love you. And uh, start doing that and fill that notebook up. Now, this one constructive criticism will probably not be easy because uh, you're, you're going to have some that you're going to think, oh, this one's hard. That's because our old flesh nature rebels and we can make excuses. And when our, our flesh or some person is criticizing us, no matter how pure that prophecy may be, we're going to have to warn ourselves, hey, I've got to listen to this. I don't want to hear it. I don't believe, maybe not even believing that it's true. But if we'll make ourselves listen, God will honor that. And no telling what it will uh, keep us from having a fall that we're going to have. Now, notice thoughts that often run through the mind of the one being criticized. That person just bugs me. Or they're just constantly on my case. I, I, I wish they'd just get off my back. They irritate me so badly, sometimes I just want to scream. I wish people would just leave me alone and quit interfering in my life. Probably all of us have had one of those thoughts at one time or another when somebody was trying to tell us something. But do any of these thoughts sound familiar? Because if we'll think about it, uh, the flesh always rebels at advice. But it's a sobering thought to remember that Romans 8 says that the mindset on the flesh is death. We need to remember that. We need to maybe write that in that notebook where we're keeping the conditions. It was death for Solomon, and it was death now for his kingdom. And it will also bring death to the areas in our life now if we're not listening. So the next time the flesh rebels and thoughts come, oh, I wish they'd just mind their own business. Remember Solomon and jump on that advice and say, wait a minute, maybe I better take a second look at this. It's worth anything to put our flesh down because the flesh is there to bring death. Our flesh will bring death. That's why we have to overcome the flesh.
Now, another way you can be made aware of areas in your life that are not right and, and will cause problems for you is to notice the things that consistently irritate other people about you. Uh, sometimes that can tell us a lot if we realize, boy, people are irritated about me, about this particular thing pretty often. We need to look at it. Is there a common thread where you irritate different people in the same area? If so, don't be an ostrich. Don't bury your head in the sand. Even though they might not be handling it in the spirit, if the same thing about you irritates more than one person, then it's usually a valid warning. And if it's left unheeded, it'll cause some degree of destruction. Okay, so we need to just ask ourselves, how, how smart am I, you know? Look at some examples of where you might have been warned in different areas. Sometimes we fail to look at different warnings that we've received. What about your outbursts of anger? Have you been warned many times about temper, you know? Uh, or being, sometimes we're warned about being moody. What about those subtle reminders that keep you uh, seen in Scripture? You're seeing them in Scripture and you're hearing them through various sources to be consistent with your children. Maybe it's the reminder to follow through consistently with the discipline of your children or the character training that you need to do for these children. Or maybe it's the reminders to see to it that the Word is first and foremost in your hand and uh, so that you're giving it out to them when they need to hear it. That needs to be first and foremost even in your home. Now, you're not going to be warned if it's not important. But I'm going to tell you what, if you heed the warning, it can save a lot of problems, not just for you, but for your children. What about those warnings to spend time with the Father and His Word and take the time? So many people say, oh, I would, I want to, but I'm just so busy. I just flat don't have time. That needs to be a big warning sign to us because I'm sure that Solomon was saying, oh, I need to do that. But he had too many other things in place of it. And so when we're hearing that, uh, we need to realize, okay, it's time for me to lay my plans before God and hear Him. What about the times now when a word comes forth in church and uh, it's telling us, draw near to the Father, and we're thinking, oh, that's for so-and-so. He needs to be drawing closer to God. And, and we start putting that idea over on somebody else. What about those warnings that seem to crop up periodically, reminding us about the words of our mouth? You know, or maybe just the bad confessions, negativism. Uh, or it could be language, unbecoming a Christian. We were in a church service one time, and this man was using really foul language. And uh, somebody called his attention to it. And I wondered if he was going to listen. I wondered if he would remember that. How smart are we? You know, how well do we listen? Solomon may have had a lot of wisdom, but he was not very smart. But we need to ask ourselves, how smart am I? How willing am I to listen? You know, we all have things that we appreciate about our mates. One thing that I always appreciated about Jack, any time I would point something out to him that I felt like, you know, that he was uh, could have done better, he was totally ready to listen. I never once had him, you know, get angry or puff up. Never once. Now, it was easier for me sometimes to justify myself. <laughs> that was a pretty easy thing to do. But not Jack. For the most part, he was very quick to listen and then to do something about it. So that's the mark of humility uh, when we can do that. Now, we all have blind spots, and we need each other because many times our friends will help us to see those blind spots. If we listen, it's really going to be to our advantage. Now, one of the saddest memories... I heard a prophecy given to this young couple. They went to our church, and by sight, they were fully serving God. And they just, you know, we were really proud of them to have them as members. But you can't know what's in the heart of somebody else. That prophecy told them, don't look to the right or to the left. Don't be led astray. Keep your eyes on me and keep serving me. Don't quit serving me. And that prophecy didn't seem to fit. Uh, but God knew their heart. And it, it was a, a time later when they did. They both slipped away, and we never saw them again. Now, if they had heeded the warning, that disaster could have been avoided. And it's bound to have grieved the Holy Spirit because he was warning them specifically. And that prophecy wasn't given to the whole group. It was given specifically to them, but they ignored the warning. Now, it's also very easy to deceive ourselves at times by saying the right thing and 
intending to be obedient. That's easy to do. Ed Cole said the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Solomon himself may have intended to change, but the Bible doesn't record that he ever got around to that. Now, every one of us have areas where tomorrow I'm going to do better. But the Bible tells us today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of change. It's today, not it doesn't say tomorrow. And it's easy be, to be deceived and have the attitude, Lord, just please keep me obedient. Help me, help me stay obedient. Well, that's okay to pray if we're making the choice for ourselves. But we can't leave that totally up to God. And I'm sure that Solomon prayed many times asking God to help him to do things right. And we can pray all day, God, help me to do things right. But then if we don't put action to it, it's not going to work. Uh, now, for God to incline his heart toward God, it was going to take him doing something about it, him joining in. And he kept right on chasing after foreign women. He wanted God to, to do all the work, you know, <clears throat> to bless him and keep him obedient in spite of disobedience. And we all want that. There's times we, oh, God, help me. This is, this is hard for me. Please just help me, you know. But God's saying, hey, I'm telling you so that you'll do something about it. The choice is ours, not God's. And he would choose rightly for us every single time. But he doesn't want a robot. He has given us a free will, and he's not going to violate our choice to continue in disobedience if, if that's what we choose to do. Now, God wouldn't care about our area of flesh. He wouldn't care about our, our area of lack of discipline <clears throat> if he didn't want to spare us now the consequences because he knows what it's going to bring. Our changes will benefit will benefit us, and that's what he wants it for. Now, Isaiah 119 says, if we choose to be willing and obedient, then we'll eat the good of the land. Very quickly, I just want to end by reminding us of the five things now that will most of us make us fail to pay attention and go God's way. Number one, when we're being extremely blessed, you'll write these down. It'll really help you. Number two, when we're saying all the right things, that's so easy when we're saying them, it's almost like we've convinced ourselves we're doing them. Number three, when we have areas where, we're being, where we are being obedient, we tend to look always at those areas. They make us feel good. Number four, when we convince ourselves that people are just picking on us, they're nagging us on us when they're giving us advice. You know, they're just always trying to say something bad about me. I don't know why they don't see my good points. Or number five, when we deceive and convince ourselves that tomorrow we are sincerely intending to make the right changes. But you know what? Sadly, tomorrow usually never comes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we can learn so much from Solomon's life. Father, he, he was hearing God's voice and he was knowing what he needed to do, but he, for some reason he just couldn't quite make himself do it. Lord, we find ourselves maybe not to the extent that he, he was going uh, sideways, but Father, we find ourselves in that position so many times where we know down in our heart things that we need to do better, we need to do differently. And if we'll be, if we'll be uh, honest with ourselves, we'll see where God is telling us over and over through different people, through different situations. And he's wanting us to change so that he can bless us. Father, help us to be open to hear what God's trying to say to us. Help us to be open and say, Father, I want to be obedient to, part, first of all, because I love you, but Lord, I want to be obedient to you because I know it's going to make things work well in my life, and that's what you want for me. And Father, that's what I want to receive in Jesus' name. Amen.